Thank you. So, uh, so far today, we've been hearing a lot of um, fantastic conversation about big concepts, stewardship, generosity, community, gratitude. My task is to focus in on one small slice, one particular practice that I suspect all of our churches engage in in some way related to this large topic of stewardship. That is to say, my topic is to invite you to think with me about the offering. What is it that we are doing when we are offering? Now, if you had asked me when I was growing up at First Presbyterian Church in Tallahassee, Florida, the church where Adam and I both grew up, if you had asked me what the offering was, it was very clear. Offering is when you put the money in the offering plate. It's what happens right after you have the sermon and the Apostles' Creed. It's right before the doxology. It's when the plates get passed, the money gets put in. That's what the offering is. Stewardship, then, is the cool part of the year in the fall when you sign up for what you're going to give and you get those cool little stewardship envelopes that you put your quarters in that you can put in the offering plate when it's your time. So my task today is to invite you to step back from that practice with me and ask, what is this that we are doing? What is it that we are offering when we are offering? And what does this practice of offering have to do with stewardship, which apparently we are rethinking this week together? <laughs> I want to suggest that there are two problems with this question. One is the conceptual, theological problem. You'll forgive me because this is my day job teaching theology. So the conceptual, theological problem is that stewardship, the concept of stewardship suggests that all things belong to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? And our job is to take care of, to tend, to keep to nurture. But offering, the very language of offering, sounds like we have stuff and we give out of our generosity to God. This idea is reinforced when we have elaborate choreographed offertory processions to the front of the sanctuary to the accompaniment of triumphant music. <laughs> Stewardship and offering are not the same gesture. Are we caring for God's resources here? Are we responding to God's grace in this practice? Or are we celebrating our fantastic generosity? That's the conceptual problem. But then today there is a practical problem, and some folks earlier have alluded to this. Fewer and fewer people are actually carrying cash. Fewer and fewer people are actually writing checks. So churches who continue to collect or receive a monetary offering in worship increasingly recognize that most of our funding actually comes online or through occasional gifts, not through weekly contributions in the offering plate. So the result is that we have this theologically and practically problematic practice of processing a bunch of half-empty offering plates to the front of the sanctuary, <laughs> which satisfies neither the budget nor really liturgical theology. This problem then offers us an opportunity to rethink, perhaps even to reform our practice. So how did we get here? A little history can help us. To begin with, it's important to recognize that offering for most of Christian history had nothing to do or very little to do with money. In the second and third centuries, people offered food to be used in the Eucharist. And then worship leaders offered prayers of praise and thanksgiving over these gifts in remembrance of Christ and in gratitude for God's gracious provision. Now, as people offered bread and wine for the Eucharist, they did also bring forward contributions for those in need. 
Justin Martyr, describing Christian worship in Rome in the mid-2nd century, says that those who are prosperous, if they wish, contribute what each one deems appropriate, and the collection is deposited with the president, who takes care of orphans and widows, and those who are needy because of sickness or other cause, and the captives, and the strangers who sojourn among us. Not unlike what we heard earlier referred to in Acts, right? So financial giving was important for the community, and for centuries, Christians continued to give to those in need each time they came to the table. Bread and wine were gathered, and deacons set aside what they needed for the service, and the rest was distributed to the poor. But this financial giving was not called offering. Instead, from the third century on, the bread and cup brought forward were increasingly described as the offering, the bread and cup, not the money. So this first part of the Eucharist was called the offering, and it was increasingly identified with Christ's own sacrifice. Cyprian of Carthage in the third century claimed that what we offer is Christ's passion. Here's Cyprian. For if Jesus Christ is himself the high priest of God, the Father, and first offered himself as a sacrifice to the Father, then that priest truly functions in the place of Christ who imitates what Christ did and offers a true and full sacrifice in the church to God the Father. More and more from the third century forward, the offering of the Eucharist represents Christ's sacrificial offering for us. Listen to these words from the Eucharistic prayer of Bishop Ambrose in fourth century Milan. We offer to you this spotless victim, this reasonable victim, this bloodless victim, this holy bread and this cup of eternal life. And we pray and beseech you, O God, to receive this offering on your altar on high by the hands of your angels, as you vouchsafed to receive the gifts of your righteous servant Abel and the sacrifice of our patriarch Abraham and that which the high priest Melchizedek offered to you. Maybe not the Old Testament figures that come immediately to your mind when you think about the Eucharistic sacrifice, but the point was that we make our offerings just as Abel did, just as Abraham did, just as Melchizedek did, just as above all Jesus Christ did before God the Father. Now, liturgical historian Robert Taft argues that in the fourth century, this language, this language of offering was metaphorical, not literal. And he criticizes the Western church for what happened next the increasingly detailed and increasingly literal discussions in the medieval era of what is being offered in the Eucharist and by whom, at what point the consecration of the offering happens and who benefits. Now, we're not gonna recapitulate all that history now. You can certainly come and we can talk about that later if you like, but suffice it to say that the medieval Roman rite gradually came to focus more and more on the priest offering the Eucharistic sacrifice on behalf of the people, and often for particular people, who did not have to be present to receive the benefit. Thus, what had begun as a functional act of preparing the table, coupled with a symbolic interpretation of self-giving in response to God's grace, became an elaborate act of priestly sacrificial offering. Yes, you don't need me to tell you what Luther had to say about all of this in the 16th century. This whole notion of human beings offering anything to God was exactly backwards, he argued. God is the one who offers gifts to us, not the other way around. The Mass is not something that we do to merit justification. It's a sacrament in which God gives us grace, not a sacrifice we offer, but a benefit we receive, to use his language. Thus, Luther did away with anything that smacked of sacrifice or offering 
Instead, he had the bread and wine prepared quietly during the creed or after the prayer, with absolutely no procession of elements. The Church of England, too, did away with all reference to the sacrifice of the Mass. In the 1549 Book of Common Prayer, the offertory, the offertory for the first time became the collection of money. This is when that happens, 1549, not before. At the offering portion of the service, people came forward to place their alms in a chest or in a box at the front of the sanctuary on their way to receiving communion. Later, in the Book of Common Prayer, it changed the practice once again so that then the money was taken up in the pew as church wardens came around and collected. 16th and 17th century reformed churches, though, the tradition from which I come, as well as English Puritans, rejected all language of offering at all. They did not bring forward bread and cup, and they did not bring forward money either, because such action implied that our contributions could do something to earn God's favor. Instead, churches in this Protestant family collected alms at the end of the service as people departed. They placed wooden chests or boxes at the doors of their sanctuaries for this purpose, a practice you can still see today in some English or Scottish churches. Yet another dramatic shift occurred in 1662. Another revision of the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer directed that during the offertory, monies were to be collected and brought to the priest who lays them on the table. This is the first time in recorded history that we have monetary offerings, instead of bread and wine, placed on the communion table. And John Wesley adapted the same practice, directing that monetary offerings are to be collected, brought to the priest, and laid on the table. So if we think about this then, uh, and think about what was going on, let's say, in 17th and 18th century America, North America, you had at least three different practices of offering. You had Roman Catholic churches who still practiced the coming forward of the bread and the cup, placing them, preparing them for the table, and that was the offering, the preparation of the table. You had Anglicans and Methodists who were bringing money forward and placing that on the table, and that was the offering. And then you had Presbyterians and other Puritan-influenced congregations that had nothing called an offering at all, but instead a collection gathered at the door. I've been unable to find out what 17th and 18th century Lutherans were doing, but maybe some of you all can enlighten me later. Now, as American Protestants grew in the 19th century, they increasingly embraced the practice of monetary offering across the board as a solemn act of worship to the Almighty God. By the 1890s, it was almost universal that Protestants in this country were collecting a monetary offering in worship. During this time, too, uh, churches and uh, across the board celebrated uh, um, increasing formality of liturgical style and a growth in neo-Gothic architecture, especially Methodists and Episcopalians. Liturgical theologian Ed Phillips, who teaches at Emory, describes the effect of this in Methodist churches, but this is not restricted to Methodists. Listen to what he says about this. By the middle of the 20th century, Methodist churches, urban and rural, small and large, formal or folksy, ritualized the weekly collection by singing a doxology as a regimen of ushers in procession brought plates of cash and personal checks to be offered to God with all the pomp of a medieval high mass. There could be little doubt that this was the ritual high point of the service. Now, in the 20th century, the ecumenical liturgical movement has shifted this practice a little bit, connecting this practice of collecting the financial offerings more to the early church practice of bringing forward the bread and the cup for Eucharist, as we heard in Justin Martyr. So I celebrate this move to connect the financial giving more to the table. I think it increases the possibility that we will see our act of giving as a response to God's own self-giving in Christ. And I also think it helps us to make the crucial connection between our being fed at the table 
and our call to go and feed the hungry. But I'm still troubled by many of the practices associated with what we call offering. Just this week, at the church where I worship in Atlanta, I noticed how little was in the plate as it passed by me, and in all the plates as they were processed forward by the ushers during the singing of, yes, the doxology. Of course, it's great that we're encouraging people to give, but whose giving are we actually celebrating? And how much are we actually giving? Two and a half percent? Not even. Not in that service. How might our liturgical gestures actually reinforce rather than undermine the fundamental pattern of grace and gratitude that ought to define Christian faith and worship. I have two proposals to address this dilemma. The first one I want to suggest is just remove financial offering from the center of worship and certainly rethink the procession of financial gifts. Like the Puritans, churches could place a basket or a box at the door as people leave to encourage financial and other giving as a part of what it means to go into the world. I hear of more and more churches who are actually doing this. Sometimes it's motivated by sensitivity to visitors or guests who don't, feel, don't want to feel compelled or co coerced to give money. In other cases, it emerges from a concern about the economic circumstances of worshipers. I know of congregations in Atlanta, for example, and in Memphis, where many or most of the worshipers experience homelessness or other forms of extreme poverty, and they do not include a financial collection in the midst of their service. At another church in Asheville, North Carolina, I know of a pastor who invites people to give support to local community outreach programs by putting donations in the boxes in the foyer as they depart and then give whatever they have left to the upkeep of the church. By placing collection at the end of worship as part of the sending, I suggest we are putting giving in its proper place as a response to God's gracious giving, which has already nourished us through water and word, bread and wine. Now, I recognize that there are drawbacks to this proposal, and it may not be right for every congregation. Certainly, giving is vital, and we want to encourage it. Placing the collection at the end of worship could make it less visible, and we need to be careful about that. We don't want to take away opportunities for people to give. For young children, the, the visibility of giving real money in worship is important, as it was for me. So, we can rethink this. But I think at least we need to ponder what our liturgical gestures are communicating. But if we do keep some form of financial offering in worship, how might we do this in a way that is actually meaningful, that keeps the focus on our giving as a grateful response to God's abundant giving? Now, there's certainly the practical issue, and I've seen many churches experimenting with ways of giving that uh, enable people to offer their contributions in a cashless society. People can give electronically in worship now in a variety of ways, and you've probably seen these. QR codes in the bulletin, giving by text. I learned that in the EKD, the main Protestant church in Germany, they are about to launch a pilot project with a digital bell bag that they pass down the pew and you can um, scan your card in the, uh, the handle of this bag as it goes by. So you can pay by credit card in worship. I'm not quite sure what the ding of the bell does as it you know, corresponds to the music that's being played, but it's an experiment. And I hear that there are Catholic churches in France that have an app that enable you to give uh, cashlessly in the context of worship as well. So there's all of these experiments going on. There are also churches experimenting with ways of signaling that people are giving, even if most of their giving is actually occurring outside of worship. I know of congregations that have laminated cards, for example, or wooden tokens that people can take and put in the offering plate to say, I am giving outside of worship, but I want the gesture of putting something in the plate as it goes by. 
These are helpful practical solutions, but the theological question is still, I think, how can we express our love for God and neighbor at this moment in worship? And how can we practice, how can we foster the practice of gratitude in Christian life? Fundamentally, how is it that our financial contribution can be a celebration of God's giving rather than our own? So this brings me to my last suggestion about how we might think about the practice of offering. If you continue to pass the plates or the baskets in worship, invite people to place tokens of gratitude, thank you notes, if you will, into the plates as they're passed, in addition to or in lieu of money. These tokens of gratitude could include pictures or lists of things for which a worshiper is grateful that week. Anyone and everyone could contribute to such an offering of thanksgiving, with or without credit card, cell phone, or bank account. And it could have the added benefit of helping congregational leaders know of prayers of thanksgiving that have gone unvoiced. Above all, this would clarify that what we are offering is not our own possessions, but a grateful response to God's self-giving. In conclusion, what are we offering when we are offering? Ourselves, our lives, and yes, our money, but not as if they were our own tightly held possessions that we oh so generously share with God. We fundamentally offer to God our thanks and our praise, and we offer our resources to the world for the healing of this world that God so loves. Thank you.